Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this evening. We are so excited that uh, Dr. Dan Scholz is back in the house with us. Uh, he's got a wonderful presentation that I've heard about half of yesterday, so I'm looking forward to hearing the whole thing today. Uh, but it is, of course, my pleasure to introduce him, so I'd like to, to uh, uh, let you know who he is, you know, because we really don't know who this guy is, right? Just <laughs> All right, so Dr. Schultz has uh, served in Catholic education for nearly 40 years. He began teaching theology in, in 1985 at Pius High School, where he served as theology department chair for 10 years. <coughs> After receiving his PhD from Marquette University in 1997 in biblical theology, he began teaching biblical studies at St. Francis de Sales Seminary. He remained at the seminary until fall of 2004, where he began a new position at Cardinal Stritch University as, bless you, as a full-time faculty member in the Religious Studies Department. For the past 20 years, Dan has served at Stritch as a professor and director of the St. Clair Center, uh, Dean of College of Arts and Sciences, Vice President of Academic Affairs, and most recently and currently and, 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 as President of Cardinal Street University. Dr. Dan is an active member of the Catholic Biblical Society and the Society of Biblical Literature. He has three published books that are available online for purchase <laughs> for you and all of your friends. <laughs> Uh, Jesus in the Gospel and Acts, the Pauline Letters, and most recently, the Catholic Epistles, Hebrews, and Revelation. He has also co-authored five workbooks for liturgical press publications and has written weekly pieces for liturgical publications since 2004. He gives presentations and lectures in biblical studies at regional and national professional conferences and in parishes, which we are very grateful for, and in schools throughout the Archdiocese. Dan and his wife, Bonnie, have three adult children and belong to Christ King Parish in Wauwatosa. Would you please help me welcome Dr. Dan. Thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight on such a beautiful night. Man, so I got a nice walk in this afternoon, so that's helpful. Um, you have handouts in front of you. Um, at the bottom is my email address. I, I still do work for Cardinal Stritch University. It turns out it takes a really long time to close a university. Um, and you know that's OK, because it keeps me gainfully employed for the time being. So, um, so that's my email address, djschultz.stritch.edu. If, if after this presentation you have questions, or if you want to copy these PowerPoint slides, I'm happy to send them to you. You just got to email me. Um, so. Um, Let's get going. Uh, I, I gave this presentation yesterday. Obviously, you all know how this works. Um, and I made a couple of little tweaks to it based on sort of how I thought it went. Um, th this is a really interesting topic because we don't actually talk about the Holy Spirit um, as much as we ought to. So I'm going to try to make a case for you tonight as to why we should um, and why the Holy Spirit's important. And so part of that, as you see in the handout, there are the three eras of the Holy Spirit that I want to talk about, sort of frame it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. In the context of that, I want to also unpack the storyline of Scripture. And I said this yesterday. I think I've probably said this in the past. But for hundreds of years, since the Middle Ages, and it really accelerated in the 18th century, we have been taught that the Bible is more or less a story of how you and I get to heaven. And if you follow it and you read it and you practice it and you do all the things the Bible tells you to do, you will get to heaven. And of course that's true. But that's not actually what the Bible storyline is about. It is not the story of how you and I get to heaven. It's the story of how God comes to earth and how God still plans to come to earth and how throughout the story of salvation history that has unfolded. So I'm going to spend some time talking about, well, how does that storyline come together in the Old Testament? How does Jesus fit into that? How do these early Christian communities fit into it? And I think most importantly, how do we in this basement fit into this? What is our role in all of that? We're going to try to do that in one hour, okay? 
<laughs> all right, all right. So I, I promise not to breathe through this. No. So three eras of the Holy Spirit. I, I want to start by just talking a second about language. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and the word that they used was ruha for, for the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's referred to as the breath of God, the wind of God. Most frequently, it's the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's used a lot. You can see in the Old Testament, it's used 389 times. By the way, all this stuff is fact-checked available. You, you, we used to have to look this up in old concordances and stuff like that. You could just look this online. Just type in Ruha. How often does Ruha appear in the Old Testament? Voila, you get your answer. In the New Testament, the New Testament is written in Greek because by the time the New Testament comes along and Jesus comes along, the entire Roman Empire has been Hellenized. By that we mean it's been saturated by Greek culture and Greek language, including the Jewish people. They, in fact, around 400 BC, took their Hebrew scriptures and translated it all into Greek. That's called the Septuagint. We believe that Jesus and Paul, they all could read the Hebrew. We, could, we think they could probably read the Greek as well. Probably Jesus grew up reading the Hebrew scriptures because he was Palestinian Jew. But the New Testament's all written in Greek. When Paul writes his letters, when the gospel writers write, they want to impact the largest possible audience. They're evangelizing, so they write in the language of the land. The word for the spirit is not ruha, but pneuma, spirit. And it's used a lot. It's used 389 times, or 383 times in the New Testament. So era one is the Old Testament that I'll spend some time on, ancient Israel. Era two is the life of the spirit with Jesus. And then era three is what I'm just calling Pentecost and beyond. And that's really where you get Acts of the Apostles and the letters of Paul. And you can see in Acts of the Apostles, the story of the early church, the Holy Spirit is everywhere. 69 times in Acts of the Apostles, the Holy Spirit is talked about. And in Paul's letters, 146 times. So just do the math. There's 13 letters of Paul in the New Testament. His letters are saturated with this discussion. And yet I've discovered in years of teaching that, that a lot of people don't really know what the Holy Spirit is and what it's about. So we're going to try to sort of bring you up to speed on all that. So I obviously want to start in the beginning. And I want to start with this really remarkable concept from the very start. Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 2, God's Holy Spirit hovered over all of the non-created cosmos yet. It, when God created, you know, the seven-day creation story, when God did that, he did that through his breath. He just, whoo, it's a beautiful concept. And that Holy Spirit is present today. And so isn't it next week that you're having confirmation here? That we believe and we profess by faith that same spirit that created the entire universe, everything in it, is that same spirit that's going to descend on these bratty 16-year-olds. That, <laughs> and it does work wonders as someone who can testify to it. Um, it's amazing. So th that's part of it. But when God created humanity, God's ruha, God's spirit, was part of it. And so you see in, in still part of the first creation story, the Lord God for the human Hebrew word for human is Adam. That's where we get the name Adam. For years and years and years, I used to teach, and I still do when a topic comes up. Adam is actually not a name of a person. It's the name of humanity, Adam. And when Adam was made, we were made out of Adama, out of the earth. This is where we get this long-standing belief that when we die, Ash Wednesday, the whole point of that is we return to the earth. We return to where we originally came from. And we wait there. We wait until the second coming. And so Adam and Adama, and with that thing, God breathed his Holy Spirit into it. And it became a human being. From the very beginning, we were part of the Trinity. We were designed to be part of it. It's a beautiful concept. And of course, you, as if you probably know the storyline, things start out really well. Uh, uh, Adam is, to, is, is walking around, and God says to humanity, 
Start naming things. Find, find partners. So Adam believes that if I name things, I will have suitable partnership with it. So he names, Adam names a crocodile and an alligator. He could figure it out. And uh, I started naming everything. And at one point, he turns to God and says, I have no partnership. I, I can't find, in naming things, I can't find suitable partnership. So God puts Adam to sleep. And this is where Eve comes from. Eve, the Hebrew word Eve is life. From Adam and Eve, from human life, two people come. And Adam, Adam, now, it's actually Ish and Isha. They, Adam wakes up and looks. And he says, oh, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Th this story in the ancient world was unrecognizable to anything anybody had ever heard. Nobody believed that creation had come like that. That male and female were amago dei. And that in this image of God, the Holy Spirit had breathed its life. That, that was a completely novel concept. And most neighboring people, the Egyptians, the, the, the Canaanites, they just thought that was crazy. Because they, they, the gods didn't operate like that. The gods made people, but the god made people to be, to be the servants of the gods. And so this, this whole idea that God created people to be his image was completely, to be his image in the world was completely brand new. So I, it's important to pause for a second on the seventh day of rest, because now I'm going to give you a crash course all the way through the Bible. On the seventh day, after God created humanity on day six, in his image. And you may recall, if you're writing stuff down, if you're prone to write things down, please write down Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Go back and read it. That was humanity's original charge. Take care of the world. Be fruitful, be multiply. You're in charge. So that when I come to dwell with you, I can feel comfortable. This is a place that I want to be. God's presence, his Shekinah, which I'm going to return through throughout this presentation, came to rest. God's glory came to rest in his creation. He sabbated, and he dwelled with his creation, and we were designed to be the stewards of this world. We were designed to take care of this world, to be holy, to be in union with God. We're in By the way, that's still true. We're in charge of the world. We just happen to have a fallen nature, which complicates things. But that, that whole framework, that the rest of the Bible doesn't make sense unless you wrap your head around that idea, that we are made in the image of God and that we are the stewards of his creation and we are in charge of it. So everything goes really well for Adam and Eve until, of course, they sin. And what Adam and Eve discover is something that we have been discovering throughout history, that God actually doesn't like sin. He doesn't like disobedience. And he doesn't like idolatry. And as the result of that, Adam and Eve are exiled out of the garden. It is Israel's, if you will, the first exile. The rest of the storyline of the Bible, and it doesn't get resolved until Revelation, the book of Revelation, the very last book, the very last two chapters, the work of God bringing us back into the garden doesn't occur until Jesus comes back at the second coming. And then that's when, and if you read, the, here's another text to write down, Revelation 21, 1 to 4. Please go back and read that if you're not familiar with it. It's, it's the image of what, okay, what exactly happens when Jesus hands over the kingdom to God. The heavenly Jerusalem comes down to earth, and God's dwelling is with us. And there is no more, and the resurrection of the dead occurs. And there's no more sadness, no more suffering, no more death. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And it's not the story of how us as saved souls get to heaven at the end of time. It's how at the end of time, God comes back to Sabbat. He comes back to dwell with us. And his Shekinah, the prophets all talked about it. His Shekinah, his glorious presence fills the earth. And we all enjoy it. And we are in resurrected bodies. We are, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus' resurrected body is the first fruits of what all of us are going to experience here on earth. 
This isn't about us sitting up in heaven playing harps for eternity. That's just to buy your time until the real event occurs. So that, so all that process starts going wrong when Adam and Eve sin and they are expelled. And one of the, the two most important things that we learn out of these opening chapters is that God is going to fix this. And God's response to Adam is Abraham. If you were to ask any Jewish rabbi, they would tell you, what, how does God plan to fix the world? How does God plan to put things right? He's going to do it through Abraham, this wandering nomad, who by the, when he first taps him on his shoulder, he's 75 years old. Sarah's 65 years old. They have no land. They have no children. They've been trying for 50 years. And God says to them, he repeats Genesis 1, 26 to 28. He says to Abraham, be fruitful and multiply. Have the world is your oyster. You can have it all if you simply obey me. And of course, Abraham says, yes, pure grace. How in the world is a 75-year-old man going to have children? And they're wandering nomads. He's a tribal chieftain leader, so he's got a people, but he's got no place. And God says, I will give you, the, it's in effect winning the lottery. Land and descendants were the two most important things in the ancient world. And God says, Abraham, I will do that. I will make you the father of all nations. This framework is important to understand. And the two things that we get of God right away is two characteristics. God cares about his created order. He's the creator of the world. And he cares deeply about fixing the world. He's a God of justice. When the, when the Bible talks about the Greek word they use is dikaiosunes. God is working to put the world right because he grieves over the present state of the world. And so he worked to fix it. Here's the problem. It's with us. God made the decision that he's going to fix the world through us. He could do it on his own, and some days we wish he would, but he's, he said, nope, I made you, and I'm going to promise you that I will do that. So... Everything seems to be going well. If you read the book of Genesis, yes, the family's fairly dysfunctional. But like all of us families, they learn to forgive each other and they learn to live with the dysfunction. But when the book of Exodus opens up, it's hundreds of years later. And you find out right at the beginning of the book of Exodus, God hears the cry of his people and he remembers his promise to Abraham. And so he frees the Israelites. He calls Moses. And of course, you know Moses, he doesn't want to do it. He's, God has got to talk Moses into doing it. And you get the sense in the book of Exodus that there are these defining moments. The first defining moment is obviously the Passover, when the angel of death passes over the house of the Israelites. And then they get freed. And, and you get the sense that, okay, it's got to be at Mount Sinai in the giving of the law. The giving of the law, was, and this is important to understand, God gave Israel that law because God promised Abraham that through your descendants, I will make the world right. So God, in calling the Israelites and giving them the law, their duty is to be holy. I give you this law because this law will show you how to be holy. Because when you're holy, like Adam and Eve were before the fall, I dwell comfortably with you. I come and I go and I, and I can sabbat with you when you're holy. This is Israel's called holiness. This is why Israel was elected through Israel. And by the way, that remains true. God never changed any of his covenantal promises. He eventually finds the one faithful Israelite through whom he will ultimately fix the world. Who is that? Thank you. Thank you. So I'm really glad some of the older folks said Jesus. I think I've told you the story in 1979 when I came home from college, my sophomore year, and I, and I told my dad that I'd learned something really interesting in my religion class. And he didn't like the fact that I was a religious studies major to begin with. He said, Dan, you you're never going to get a job with a, being a religious studies major. And I said, I found out that Mary was Jewish. And so was Jesus. And my dad was going to withdraw me from UW-Eau Claire. He thought this got to be some kind of pagan institution. This is 1979, in which it was a novel, to me, I had never actually heard that before, that Jesus was Jewish. 
And I have learned over time, over all of these years of studying this, we have actually, since the second century, and particularly in the last 300 years, have very effectively de-Judaized the New Testament. We have completely stripped it of its, of its Jewish roots. And there were many periods in history where it was actively trying to do that. And it goes all the way back to the Gospel of John, the Jews who killed Jesus, and how many of the early Christians really turned on that. But understanding this Jewish storyline and understanding that Jesus as Israel's Messiah is ultimately what saves the world, not as the Christian Savior. He is that, that doesn't exist in history when Jesus is born. So I, I, I'm thinking giving of the law, that's got to be the most important point. And in fact, it's actually something that happens after the law is given. And the Israelites are wandering out in the desert. And... God tells them to build a tabernacle. It's Exodus 25. It takes them 15 chapters to build this tabernacle. And by the time you get to Exodus chapter 40, something remarkable happens. God's Shekinah enters into the tabernacle. It's a microcosm of the original creation. And they all believed it. They had believed, because it was true, God actually was living with them out in this <coughs> desert. And it was in the temple. And for those of us who might want to poo-poo that and say that silly superstition, it's a foreshadowing to the Eucharist. So, and and this, is, this is why the storyline doesn't hold together for many Catholics, because if you don't believe in the real presence in the Eucharist, all of the rest of this stuff seems kind of silly. But from the very beginning, and, and again, God's presence in this world, beginning with the Israelites to try to put the world right, was so God can come here. This, this isn't so much, even though this is part of it, about you and I getting to heaven. But when you think about what is this emphasis on forgiveness of sin, many people perceive that the emphasis on the forgiveness of sin is so you can be good enough to get to heaven. And while there is part of that, that is absolutely true, the force of the forgiveness of sin is so that we can be holy. Because when we're holy, God can be present. Forgiveness of Jesus needs to forgive sin so that God can come into this world. That's the point of it. I don't disagree at all, and Scripture teaches and the church teaches that part of the forgiveness of sin is for your salvation. So please don't hear anything else but that. But that is a small piece of this larger narrative. Your salvation is so that God can come into this world the way he had originally intended for it. It isn't about you behaving in such a way that you don't go to hell. Do you know what I mean? Many people think about it that way. That's not the biblical storyline. God enters for the first time back into the world in a concrete way since the Garden of Eden. And he's now in this wilderness tabernacle. And so everything is going wonderful. The golden age comes. Moses and the Israelites, they end up settling. Moses doesn't get into the promised land. But the Israelites do. They build this huge temple. Solomon builds it. They take the tabernacle with the Ark of the Covenant, and they put it in Jerusalem's temple, and God now comes to dwell. 1 Kings chapter 8. God's Shekinah was dwelling at rest in Israel. God could finally, because the journey was over, God could rest. God could sabbat. That's why one of the Ten Commandments is keep holy the Sabbath. It's not so much about you and I resting. It's about God resting. And it's about us recognizing that God desires to rest with us. And the only way that's going to happen is if you're holy. Because it's not that God doesn't love us. God doesn't like sin. It annoys him. And idolatry really annoys him. So he pushes it away. So this Jerusalem temple, everything is beautiful. It's Israel's golden age. It lasts about 100 years. Solomon dies, King Solomon. It's the year 922 BC, and it all starts to go wrong. It's 1862 to 1865 all over again, except in the past. It was Israel's civil war. The north and the south split in half. They were only about 200 miles north to south. It was a relatively small kingdom, but they divided the 10 tribes in the north, so everything from the Illinois border up to Green Bay were the ten tribes of Israel, northern kingdom. Southern tribe was Jerusalem and Benjamin, Judah. And that was Chicago and the surrounding region. So if you can geographically think about those images, that, that, that leads ultimately to a collapse 
all of the prophets are coming at that time, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha, they're all coming during this 400 year span, trying to keep Israel together, trying to reunite them, trying, reminding them of the covenant, reminding them of Shekinah, reminding them of our, Israel's call to be holy. When Jesus on, on Sermon on the Mount says to all of the people gathered, Jews and Gentiles alike, be the light of the world, be the salt of the earth. The Jews in the audience would have said, hey, that's our charge. We, Israel, is to be the light of the world. We're to be the salt of the earth. We're the holy people. And Jesus begins to expand that, obviously. So during the Babylonian exile, prophets arise. Ezekiel and Isaiah are there. And there is this haunting sense that God had left. In fact, I'm going to show you in a minute a vision that Ezekiel has that God had left. And that begins what's called the Second Temple Period. When they come out of Babylonian exile and rebuild the temple, all of the prophets, what we call the post-exilic prophets, all pray for the future return of God's glory into the temple, Shekinah. Will God come back and tabernacle with us again in Israel? We've rebuilt this temple. Herod the Great greatly expanded it hoping and believing that if we just put on a couple of additional rooms and maybe a downstairs bathroom, maybe God will come. And of course, when Jesus comes, the gospel writers, think about the opening chapter of the Gospel of John. And John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. John is literally writing a new Genesis story. And he's also writing a new Exodus story. Because this is another verse you should write down, John 1.14. And, and the word became flesh, and we translate it dwelt with us. It's, and the word became flesh, the Greek word is tabernacled. And the word became flesh, God bless you, and tabernacled with us. And what's the next verse? And we saw his glory. These early believers of Jesus had recognized that God's Shekinah, in fact, did return after 490 years of the Second Temple period, but didn't return to the temple. It didn't return to Mount Sinai. It came in a person. And that's what they're writing about. And they're writing about this history, this history that God had promised them. And, and Paul, when he writes, he realizes Jesus is the first faithful, obedient Israelite. He's the first one. He becomes the firstborn of all creation. It's new creation. He, he becomes the prototype of what genuine humanity looks like. And when Jesus says, be as perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, many of us think, oh, obviously that's not going to happen. How in the world could any of us do it? He was foreshadowing our destiny. We, we will be in the age to come. We will be in resurrected bodies. We will be as perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, just like Jesus was. So the, these early Christian writers, they're picking up on all of these Jewish themes. And you begin to realize that the early church, these early Christians, you see it in Acts of the Apostles. We're hearing it right now in, the, in Sunday when we're hearing out of Acts of the Apostles. Believers themselves become spirit-filled. Understand what this is saying. That this spirit that created all of the world, created all of the universe, that came down into that tabernacle, into that temple, into Jesus himself, now is in us. This is, what, this is what we're saying to these kids next week in confirmation. They are too young to understand this. How could they possibly understand it? And I'm not saying the spirit can't do remarkable things. But, and all grace flows from that. But really, that sacrament is unbelievable. And, of course, baptism as well is closely tied to it. The whole point of the entire Bible storyline is to lead you to the end. When you get to the end and you realize that ultimately God is a God of justice and he is going to fix the world through us and ultimately he will come back here. We as Catholics believe and Christians believe that is what the second coming is all about. We call it the parousia, the appearance when God comes back, when Jesus comes back. And he's going to come back to judge the living and the dead. And who are the living? Us. Like if Jesus comes later tonight, <laughs> wouldn't be a bad night to show up. And, and who are the dead? 
This, this is where our, where our eschatology is very underdeveloped. Because many people believe that when you die and your soul goes to heaven, you have risen from the dead. You have not risen from the dead. This is what the church teaches. I'm, I'm not saying anything the church doesn't teach. We just don't connect these dots. You, don't raise, you aren't risen from the dead until Jesus comes back. The, the, we hear all the time, everyone in heaven is waiting for this. Mary is, Jesus is. God, when the disciples said, when are you going to come back? Jesus said, only the Father knows. So all of our loved ones, all the saints, all the angels, they are absolutely in heaven. But that isn't their final destiny, and they know that. They are waiting for God to complete his work of justice, to restore creation the way it always was intended. Isn't that beautiful? And, our, and, our, and I'm pretty sure our relatives know that. They're just like, well, sorry, we're not allowed to tell you that until you get here. But that, in fact, we're not going to be playing harps up here in heaven forever. In fact, we are all going to be reunited. And we're going to be in glorified bodies. Luke, Paul says Jesus is the first fruits, his resurrected body. So the early church all believed, well, that's got to be Jesus. At eight, like he was 33, so it's going to be our bodies at 33. And I thought, no, no, no. Our bodies at 23, maybe. But 33 is no. <laughs> so th this is... This is an important framework to have in mind as we now go through the three eras. So just a couple other preliminary points. So, no, so now you see, and we're hearing this, in this Easter season, when Jesus breathes and says, receive the Holy Spirit. When he breathes, it's the original act of creation. When God's breath came and created everything. And he's creating something new with these disciples. And look what he says. Now can you see why forgiveness of sin is so important? You forgive sins. Receive the Holy Spirit and forgive sins so that God can come and be with us. Most people read this as a private pact. Receive the Holy Spirit, forgive sins so you can get to heaven. And I want to say again that is very important. But that is not how God is going to do his justice in the world. God didn't create the world. God, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son to save the world. What in the world is God saving the world for? Us. I know it's rhetorical. God is saving the world for us. Romans chapter 8, all of creation is groaning, waiting, and travel. The, the, the created order is fallen as well. And it is waiting for when God comes back, restores it, and the trees are, the prophets talk about this, the trees are literally going to clap. And the lion is literally going to lay down with the lamb. Uh, the, the natural evil that we see, tornadoes, hurricanes, all gone. The squirrels that you see attacking each other, going after the bird food in your yard, gone. Squirrels won't attack each other. The, the, the sparrows won't attack each other. It'll be paradise. It'll be before the fall with the forgiveness of sin. And then this is important. This is Ezekiel. At the age to come, at the end of time, even though many people rightly believed that this was a prophecy of Jesus, it's actually ours as well. Ezekiel had seen, you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and make you come out of them, my people. I will put my Holy Spirit, Ruha, into you as I had originally done so that you may come to life and I will settle you in your land. You notice that it, and I, it doesn't say, and I will take you to heaven. I am raising you from the dead to restore what my original intention was all along, that we would peacefully coexist. And the only way that's going to happen is if you have the spirit dwelling within you, as we had done in the beginning. It's a beautiful, beautiful concept. That, that's the storyline. Now I'm going to try to go through the eras. How did this all get constructed like this? So these quotes that I'm giving you, this is King David. King David recognizes that he has a sense of the Holy Spirit in him. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. So, 
to give you a sense of how embedded the Holy Spirit is in the Old Testament storyline. The person who actually built the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, the one that Indiana Jones finds, that's a gentleman by the name of Beelzebub. And we're told that the Holy Spirit, the divine spirit, was in him and gave, filled him with the skill and understanding and knowledge of every craft. How to build, if you read Exodus, or Exodus 25 to 40, you, and you see the building of the Ark of the Covenant, the building of the tabernacle, the, the artisan who was in charge of doing that was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's how he was able to accomplish it. When the Israelites are out in the desert and they're wandering and Moses is pulling his hair out, he can't take it anymore because the Israelites keep fighting and mourning and complaining and he prays to God and God takes 70 people aside and he takes the Holy Spirit on Moses and starts distributing it to these 70 leaders. From the very beginning, not only was the Holy Spirit accompanying them, as you know, that pillar of fire during the day or the cloud during the day, the pillar of fire at night, those are images of the Holy Spirit. It's coming right down to how do we govern these people? How do we take, how many people, by the way, are out there in that desert? I know. One important clue that we have is the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers opens up, just go and read it. It starts listing the 12 tribes of Israel. And it lists how many men are in each of the 12 tribes that are wandering through the desert. Take a piece of paper, start adding up the numbers, because they this says how many are in the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah. At the end, it comes out to be a little more than 604,000 men. That's the size of Moses' army. That's how they would have thought about it, because they're battling while they're crowed. So, all of these men, many of them likely have wives and children. So our guess is there's about 2 million people in this desert wandering. And Moses is like, I can't do this by myself, obviously. So they appoint 70 people and divide it up and organize it that way. The Holy Spirit's part of that. The, um, the prophet Isaiah. He's the, the prophet Isaiah is the first one to reveal to us what the gifts of the Holy Spirit would be. And he says, the new King David, the new because. David is already dead. King David is dead 300 years by the time um, Isaiah comes on board. And there was this belief that a, a coming messianic age, a new King David would appear. And Isaiah is the one who says, the spirit of the Lord, the Ruha Yahweh, shall rest upon this new king. And you can see the gifts of the Holy Spirit are listed. When Ezekiel is in Babylonian exile, remember I said earlier that that when the temple is destroyed in Jerusalem by the Babylonians, there is this great fear of where is the God Shekinah going to go? And Ezekiel, on July 31st, no, I'm sorry, September 17th, 592 B.C. Chapter 10 of Ezekiel literally opens up with that date. They use it in different terminology, but we calculate it. In the fall of 592 B.C., Ezekiel was in exile five years in Babylon, and he has this vision. In a vision, the Spirit lifted me up and me, brought me back to the exiles in Chaldea, that's Babylon, by the Spirit of God, Rahu, uh, uh, Rahu Elohim. Sometimes it's the Spirit of Yahweh, sometimes it's the Spirit of the Lord, sometimes it's the Spirit of God. It's different terms, but it's always the Spirit. Ezekiel sees literally God's Shekinah leaving the temple. And the prophet Daniel, who emerges shortly after the Babylonian exile, says, you think this Babylonian exile was bad, lasted 70 years? The next exile will be 70 times 7. It will be 490 years before you see God return. And just think about the date. That's 515 B.C. What happens about 490 years later? Emergence of John the Baptist the birth of Jesus. Do you know what I mean? That many, many people, that's why you see in the John's gospel in particular, the Pharisees were asking, are you the Messiah? Because they're doing the calculations. They're like, is this the return of Shekinah? And they, this ends era one. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit literally grieves in what we call Second Temple Judaism. 
the period between the rebuilding of the temple in 515 BC and the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD that Jesus foretold. That period from Adam and Eve's exile from the garden to Israel's extended exile beyond the Babylonian captivity. Human sin, disobedience, and idolatry isolated humanity from God. And God grieved. Slavery to sin kept Israel in exile. So forgiveness of sin would be needed for God to return and dwell with his creation. Understand that formula. So forgiveness of sin was needed. Yes, for your sin to be forgiven, but for God to come and dwell with us. So that leads into era two, the life of Jesus. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. When you open up the New Testament, if you have this, it, this, this theology of the Holy Spirit from the Old Testament, you, your jaw drops at hearing the angel Gabriel comes and says, what to Mary? That the spirit of the Lord is overshadowing you. And the Jesus is literally conceived by the Holy Spirit. Nothing in the Old Testament even remotely comes close to that. So even though the Holy Spirit is in us, the Holy Spirit doesn't overshadow women and produce the Son of God. That was unprecedented in the storyline of Israel's scriptures. And you begin to see as Jesus is the young man, you see all the major players around him. So Zachariah and Elizabeth are John the Baptist's mom and dad. The Holy Spirit fills them. The Holy Spirit fills Mary. The Holy Spirit fills Simeon, the prophet, who foreshadows what's going to happen in the life of Jesus. There is this sense early on that the Spirit is guiding the incarnation. And you, in the transition that Jesus makes out of just living in the ordinary, hidden in the ordinariness of human life, our catechism teaches us, he's growing up, and when he makes that transition and gets baptized by John the Baptist and then goes out in the desert, the Holy Spirit is very much present in that. And, and present in some really interesting and profound ways. The Spirit drives Jesus out into the desert to confront Satan. And if you've ever wondered, what, why do the gospel writers tell it the way they do? Just think about the temptation. Jesus is in the desert for 40 days. It is intended to match the 40 years of Israel in the desert. And the three temptations that Jesus faces were the temptations that the Israelites constantly fell to in the desert over that 40 years. There is this conscious effort that, that the gospel writers are saying, he is the true Israelite. He is literally living the life of Israel. And he's modeling and showing, how do you navigate that world? How do you navigate Satan? How do you navigate demons? And they're all around Jesus throughout his entire, the, the number one miracle, and you're going to hear it all summer long. Once we get out of the Easter season, we're back to Gospel of Mark. Exorcism is the number one thing that Jesus does in the Gospel of Mark. He is an exorcist, and he is constantly battling evil because those powers and principalities have been with us from the very beginning. The power and principality, the way that the Genesis talked about it in that garden, was this serpent. But there are powers and principalities that are completely neutral. Think of gravity would be a really good example. That's a, you need it. If we don't have gravity, we'd all be floating around in this room. So there are some powers and principalities that appear to be neutral. There are other powers and principalities that appear to be fueled by us. A really good example would be love. Love is a power and a principality in this world. And if it's done right, and if you're in a holy relationship with it, love can be a beautiful thing between a husband and wife, between children and their parents. It can also go into a really bad way. It can turn into lust. It can turn into Pornography. What do you think is doing that? It's us in, in God's image when we take those powers and principalities and hand over to them those things that belong to us. And so when you love your spouse and your children and your parents and your neighbor, you, that's the power you have. But boy, do those powers and principalities want to wait and watch and take advantage when it goes a little wrong, when sin enters into love. It distorts. 
we, it actually, we become, our image of God becomes, becomes to decompress. It decomposes into, the really good example would be drugs. I am really glad for metropolol. How many of you guys have any heart issues? And Eloquist. Starting to ring a bell, right? Right? It's keeping you alive. It's keeping me alive. And it's a good thing. But when it goes wrong, when it's laced with fentanyl, when, when you become a cocaine addict and a crack addict, you become just a shell of who you are. And you would be very mistaken to think that that is just choices that you're making. That those are demonic forces in the world that turn what is God's good creation and distort it. And the only way it happens is by you sniffing that cocaine. So yeah, the devil can't do anything without you. It needs you, but it will ultimately destroy you. And the ancient world understood that completely. <clears throat> so much of our world, particularly since the Enlightenment, we simply poo-poo that. Oh, that wasn't the demon that Jesus exercised. That poor girl had epilepsy, and he just sort of figured out how to fix that. Yeah, this devil's part of all of that process. Jesus' public ministry, the work of the Holy Spirit. The gospel writers are very clear. Jesus comes into Galilee. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He comes into Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. There is this sense that the Spirit launches Jesus' public career but then steps back. Because if you read the gospel storylines, if you're familiar with them, the, the Spirit isn't around. And, and, in, and in fact, Jesus will talk about the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit's obviously around. It's in Jesus. But it's not around the way that it traditionally is in the rest of the gospel storylines. It's as though when the Son is here, the Son is filled with the Spirit. The Spirit, and in fact, at, at, in John's Gospel, in the farewell discourse, at one point when the disciples realize what Jesus is talking about, they're saying to him, please don't leave. And what does Jesus say? Actually, you guys, I have to go. If I don't ascend to the Father, the Holy Spirit cannot descend onto you. And there is, so there is this sense, and the Gospel writers and Paul, while Jesus is here, there is a sense that the Spirit is at rest. So what does Jesus say? A couple of things about the Holy Spirit that are really interesting. One is kind of scary. He says at one point, you know, if you sin against the Son of Man, that's forgivable. But a sin against the Holy Spirit is the only unforgivable sin. So I, I have long thoughts. Theologians have long debated about what does that mean to blaspheme? And I don't think I want to know. Because I can always claim the plausible deniability on Judgment Day. I did not know that that was a blaspheme against the Spirit. <clears throat> but a gentleman came up to me yesterday after yesterday's talk, and his name is Bob. I'm sure you guys know him. Very Spirit-filled man. Filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said he senses the Spirit in his life move and act. To me, when you sense that, and this is for all of us, when you sense the Spirit present in your life, and you deliberately say no. That's the blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. All of us, one of the things in, in, over the years, I've had a variety of spiritual directors. They're mostly priests that I have a scotch and a cigar with. Um, but one very good, wise priest said to me years ago, he said, part of the trick is learning how to dance with the Holy Spirit. And, and, and that you're, you're not going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit if you step on the Spirit's toe when you're dancing. Do you know what I mean? You, you're doing a slow dance and the Spirit wants you to do, you know, a polka, you're probably going to have some trouble. But I, I, have tr I have really, in my life right now, trying to discern, well, what in the world am I going to do? What, what, what do ex-presidents of universities do? Um, and so, the, the, like, the, the prayer to the Holy Spirit and watching and guiding, and I've learned, I'm sure many of you have learned, at least for me, yes, actual Holy Spirit doesn't come and knock me on the head, typically. Um, it acts through other people. Other people come into my life. Conversations happen. Doors open. Doors shut. And that's the dance with the Holy Spirit. And you're going to get it wrong sometimes. Sometimes you're going to get it right. Getting it wrong with the Holy Spirit is, I don't think it's a blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. I think it's just the limitations of us. The desire and the, 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 the willingness to do that is what really matters. 
And so that, that whole sense of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, the only time you actually see something close to it is in the fifth chapter of Acts of the Apostles when Anna and Sapphira, a couple, bring the money that they sold from the house. The early Christians sold property and brought it to the disciples, laid it at their feet. And, and apparently Anna and Sophia, they made a deal and said, we're only going to give them like 75%. We'll keep the 25% for our retirement plan. Holy Spirit zaps them dead. And it's like that, that's the only example that I can think of in the, in the acts where you get the Holy Spirit acting. But this other idea of you're going to get dragged in front. Jesus is saying to his disciples, what, what you are saying and what we are preaching about, you, this is going to make people angry. And, and they're, they're going to drag you in front of synagogues. Don't worry. And leaders, don't worry. The Spirit will be there and help you and guide you. And at the, the farewell discourse, the, the, the two chapters that I would encourage you, you should write this down if you, if you really want to get some depth of understanding of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14 and Romans chapter 8, Paul's letter to the Romans. The, those two chapters are, are the richest deposit of the theology of the Holy Spirit. And in John chapter 14, as part of the farewell discourse, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the hagian numa, that the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of what I told you. How many times have you heard this ridiculous comment that, well, it was 40 years between Jesus' life and the actual writing of the Gospels. Surely they forgot stuff. Surely they were making it up. And I just say, would you, would you just trust a little bit that the Spirit is at work with that and that Jesus was actually very clever in how he told stories and points that he made. They were very rememberable. That's why he was a parabolic teacher. He taught in parables. The Spirit of truth will guide you to all truth. There is the sense that the point of the Holy Spirit guiding us to truth is so that we can help bring God's justice to the world. Do you understand what I'm meaning by the word, the word justice? Talking about, and scripture is talking about, you and I helping God put the world right. I don't know what you think of when you think of the word justice, but this is the biblical sense of it. God cares deeply about fixing the world. And he's choosing not to fix it on his own. He's choosing to be very democratic about it. He's choosing to say to all, you all have a right to vote in this process. Every single person has the ability to help me fix the world. And you do it in your, old cor in your own corner. You know, that you, you, you figure out the way. That's part of vocational call. That's part of what your journey is. That's what that our fundamental human vocation is the image of God. It, all else is secondary to that. Me being called to be a teacher and to understand scripture, that's a means to an end in, in terms of Imago Dei. So era three, the Holy Spirit. Once Jesus rises and the Holy Spirit descends, what starts to happen? So one of the first things that I would point out to you is that in Acts of the Apostles, you wouldn't know this unless you're reading Acts of the Apostles, but there's actually three different Pentecosts. The only one that we celebrate liturgically in the formal way that we do it is the descent of the Holy Spirit on the, the Jewish disciples in Jerusalem. It's a room full of 120 people. Mary's there. Much of Jesus' family's there. The disciples there. Their spouses are there. It's a room like this with 120 people, and the Spirit descends on them. But the Spirit also descends upon the Samaritans in chapter 8 of Acts. And in chapter 10 of Acts, the Spirit descends upon the Gentiles. In other words, and the, the, Luke, who's writing Acts of the Apostles, is well aware of this. This is actually the fulfillment. You're seeing God's fidelity. The term that Paul uses is God's righteousness. God's, whenever Paul uses the term God's righteousness, what he means is God is always faithful to the covenants he made with Israel. And so when the Holy Spirit is descending upon these different groups, it's actually God fulfilling his promise to Abraham. I am going to make you the father of all nations. Through you, your land and descendants will populate the world. And that is, that is playing itself out in Acts of the Apostles once you start seeing that. Torah literally is fulfilled. 
Pe the Feast of Pentecost for Jews was the feast of celebrating when God gave Israel the law. And the reason God gave Israel the law is so they could be holy and that they could be God's instrument through which God could come into the world. They celebrate that. And when you read Acts of the Apostles, go back and read Acts chapter 2. Look at how it starts out. Luke tells us when the day of Pentecost was fulfilled. The descent of the Holy Spirit onto these different groups is fulfilling everything Torah talked about. Because now all the nations are imbued with the Holy Spirit. That's what Torah was teaching Israel how to do. So you see in Acts of the Apostles, as things are playing out, the Holy Spirit baptizes them, obviously, in Acts chapter 2. But it baptizes these other nations as well. How I wish, the church never asks me about these things, but if they were to call me up and say, well, how would you sort of fix that thing about Acts only chapter 2, I would say to each liturgical year, year A, year you see, those readings focus one year on, on the Jewish nation, then one year on the Samaritans, and one year on the Gentiles. And the, the reason this is so important from, from the biblical point of view, Samaritans are half Jews. They're half breeds. They, they are Jews whose bloodlines were mixed, either with the Assyrian invasion or the Babylonian invasion. They do not have pure bloodlines. So they're not considered real Jews. And so, they, but they're part of the covenantal promise. All people are part of the covenantal promise. Israel struggled with this. This is why Paul got beat up so often. Because Paul was saying, I know that we were the chosen people. We're the elect. But with the resurrection of Jesus, new creation has been launched. Everything is now different. And God's spirit is descending everywhere. Well, you know, Israel rightly and appropriately took great pride in them being God's chosen people. They weren't ready to give it up. Some obviously did, but many of them didn't. So the Holy Spirit fills them, guides them in their preaching, in their, in their leadership. But something else is really important to understand, and this is important for us to understand, because we're, we're going to end with what Paul's got to say about this. When you are spirit-filled, you will suffer. Being spirit, that's part of the journey. When Paul says, I was crucified to the Lord, he, he's making a reference to that when, when, when Jesus literally says, if you want to be my disciple, you have to be willing to carry your cross. And in the first century, he literally meant that, that this may ultimately cost you your life. This may ultimately cost you your friends. This may ultimately cost you your coworkers. This, fill in the blank, that this is not an easy road. Fixing the world is not easy. Because if it was easy, it would already be fixed by now. You will suffer when you try to fix the world. And then we'll suffer in all kinds of different ways. But let me end with what Paul has to say about this in these last couple of minutes. Pentecost and beyond. For Paul, the whole story of Israel points to God's plan to put the world right, not just in Jesus, but also through the Holy Spirit. Because you remember when I said how often Paul talks about the Holy Spirit? Right? 147 times. It's everywhere. God's salvation is assured because of the work of the Son and the gift of the Spirit, not just to his people, but the gift of the Spirit through his people. Yes, the Holy Spirit came to the disciples. Yes, the Holy Spirit is going to come to our compromise here next week. But that's not the end of the story. That's not the point. The point of the Spirit coming to you is that it can work through you. And Paul is the first one to start etching that out in his letter to the Romans and in that eighth chapter. The work of the Spirit literally conforms us, believers, into God's image bearers, restoring our dignity so that we can share in God's project of new creation. The original dignity that God gave to that original creation of humanity when he breathed his breath into it and it came alive. Paul literally saw that people who would come to believe in Jesus, that was what was happening to them. The last three points that Paul makes. Redeemed humans through the Spirit are to be filled with Shekinah. 
like Israel's temple, and set in authority over the world as genuine human beings. When Paul says, you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you, that's literally what he means. I know many people hear that and they think Paul is talking metaphorically. He is not. He, he literally believes that this is how you become a genuine human being. He was not only teaching these early believers in Jesus what to think, but how to think. That's what I'm trying to do with you all tonight. How do you think about the Holy Spirit? I mean, how exactly does it work? How does it work in us and to us and through us? And we are a new creation with it. God's Spirit offers a variety of gifts, knowledge, faith, healing, in the work needed for new creation. So whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. The whole new things have come. Literally, when Easter Sunday, what, what is so strange about our current moment in time, our liturgical celebrations, we do such a beautiful job of Lent. That 40-day buildup, and I love it. I always lose weight, and I always, you know, it's, it's a very good thing. But we take it really seriously. And Triduum, right? Ash Wednesday, the churches are filled. Triduum, it's a beautiful, it's beautiful. And I swear to you that when Easter Sunday is done, pretty much Christians think, well, that's the end of the story. Jesus rose from the dead. It's like, that's actually the beginning of the story. The story doesn't actually begin until Jesus rises from the dead. And then we as a church are now supposed to spend 50 weeks of 50 days of celebrating. The 40 days of fasting are supposed to be followed by 50 days of single malt scotch. <laughs> We're, we are supposed to be celebrating that God's new creation began and that we're actually invited to make it happen. That's the whole point. And that, in, that, that when, when on our judgment day, when our souls go to heaven and Jesus embraces us and says, well done, good and faithful servant, it, it's not going to be so much about, yeah, you know, you kept the commandments and you stayed out of trouble and you remained faithful to your wife. How does that have anything to do with new creation? That's what you're going to be held accountable for. What did you do to help bring God to dwell in this world? What did you do? Yes, you getting saved and going to heaven is part of it, but it's, so, it's that much, and there's so much bigger. That's what Paul is talking about. The fruits of the Spirit offer us a foretaste of what life in the new creation is going to be. When we rise from the dead and come back to earth, look at what the Spirit is going to leave us. Joy. Peace, patience, self-control, gentleness. It, it, it's a promise and it's a theology of the Holy Spirit that we have only begun to tap into. Do you know what I mean? We, for centuries, and I literally mean this for centuries, the theology of the Holy Spirit has been sitting on the back burner. And it, it's time we sort of resurrect it. Because it doesn't make, this, we talk about this all the time, a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And the Spirit is really important part of the process. But you can even see in our Nicene creeds, correct? We say it every Sunday. We save the Holy Spirit right to the end. But remember what the Holy Spirit, what those words are. We believe in the, the, the Holy Spirit, the, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life of the world to come. The church does not teach that the life of the world to come is heaven. The life of the world to come is this world where God, we look forward to when God comes to this world and we rise from the dead. Isn't that a beautiful way to think about it? That's how Paul talked about it. That's how the early gospel writers talked about it. That's why Mark ends, and we'll end on this, why Mark ends chapter 16. We heard this if you went to the Saturday Easter vigil. Chapter 16, verses 1 to 8, it ends with the empty tomb. There's no resurrection sightings in the gospel of Mark. Because Mark was saying, when Jesus said the kingdom of God is coming in the world, it's time for God to become king, Mark's final exclamation point is this is what the world looks like when God is king. The graves are empty. What a beautiful way to think about that. And we'll end on that note. The enduring gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. So pretty good, 708. Okay. Any questions? Yes. So are you basically saying that when
when we die now, our body's going to be in the earth, our soul's going to go somewhere, and then ultimately we'll have a resurrected body and we're going to be here on this earth. It's not what I'm saying, it's what the church teaches. Seriously. And our resurrected souls are in heaven and we are at rest. And we are with God, and we're with Jesus and Mary and the saints and the angels. But that is not the end of the story, even though many people think that it is. But God, I just, just remember John 3, 16, God so loved the world. Why would God love the world just to get us out of here and let it burn in its own fat? Yes. Tell just the beginning to read the internet a little bit. The Gospel of Google. Look at that. Okay. And, and, you know, I don't know how many different, there are seven or eight major religions in the world. Or whatever. Yeah. What happens to those other, for one of the major religions, what happens to the rest of the... Yeah. The church teaches that in any, and this is Second Vatican Council yeah. theology, it, any anyone who sees God with a sincere heart is saved through the Messiah. Through, we say Christ. But, but their God, who's ever God, our God is different than the, the Baptist on the world or the Presbyterians or the world. The same kind of God. There's, there's a Jesus is a God. I mean, the faith that we're in too. How do, you, how do you manage that in terms of how, how does God look at that? I, I have no idea. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, if you're talking about, so you're talking about two different things, I think. Interfaith relations, yeah. how do Christians, and then ecumenical relations. And to, to me, so the church teaches that in all of the major religions, there is truth and holiness. The, the, the ultimate revelation of God's truth and holiness is in Jesus. I think far more problematic theolo theologically is the broken body of Christ that we politely refer to as ecumenism the ecumenical body. I think if Jesus and Paul were here today, and, and really ever since the Protestant Reformation, they, they, would, they would be unsettled by all of these different Christian denominations. That Paul struggled with that. Just read 1 Corinthians. You know, the first four chapters are all about stop this. There, isn't, there should not be a church for Apollo, a church for Peter. There shouldn't be a St. Peter, a St. Mary, a St. Uh, you know, Peter and Paul. There shouldn't be a St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. That, that, is, that is the marks of a fallen world. We are to be the one body of Christ. Now, we Catholics believe, and I, and I think we're right, in that we hold the truth. The church holds the truth. We are to be doing the work of bringing our brothers and sisters into the faith. But, and, and there are many people who work really hard and very effectively at it. But it's hard. And I don't, I don't think it's, it's a very good testament. To human history. So, from the spirit, are we are we all part of your second coming in terms of us trying to create a, a unified faith community in the world? In all of Paul's letters, this is a really important point. There's only two things that Paul stresses because you think justification by faith, or you think of the classic Pauline theology issues that have been debated since the Middle Ages. In truth, the only thing that Paul absolutely consistently says in every single letter is every one of his communities, and this is true to today, are called to two things, holiness and unity. Everything else, if you have, hol if you have holiness and unity, faith, hope, and love will reside. But when you don't have unity and holiness, it falls apart, it, it breaks apart. And, that, and, and so I would argue, yes, in America, American Christianity needs, a, needs to work a lot on unity and holiness. Because it's easy to be united when we're all Catholics. Mm -hmm. right. Right. So is that the can, job can I pause one second? Hold on, you guys can keep talking. Parents, Moms and dads got to go. Parents, you got to go. Hey, uh, if you, you got an email about a, so if you want a hard copy, here it is. And I'll put it over here. Sorry, sorry parents. And, Yes, and if you want a copy of these slides, there's my email address. I'm happy to send it. Yes, ma'am. I have the Holy Spirit.
Thank <laughs> you.